You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics, our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. Fargo, the new virtual assistant from Wells Fargo, makes banking faster and easier. Like this. Fargo, what's my checking account routing number? And this. Fargo, uh, turn off my debit card. And this. Fargo, what did I spend on groceries last month? And that's just the beginning. Do you, Fargo? You can in the Wells Fargo mobile app. Learn more at wellsfargo.com slash getfargo. Terms and conditions apply. Your mobile carrier's availability and message and data rates may apply. Wells Fargo Bank and a member of DIC. Hello, everyone. I'm here to tell you about History Daily, a daily, yes, daily, history podcast that takes one historic event from that day, and every day has historic events, and tells you about it. History Daily takes you back in time every weekday, and is hosted by Lindsey Graham, and co-produced by award-winning podcasters Airship and Noiser. Some of the topics are well known, I'll give you one guess, for it was covered on the most recent December 7th episode, but some will almost certainly surprise you. Coming up on this episode are two episodes that were pulled from History Daily's back catalog. The first covers the end of the Battle of Stalingrad, and the second, the liberation of Auschwitz. A few others that they have available that you might be interested in are an episode on the Beer Hall Push from 1923, and Franco's entry into Barcelona during the Spanish Civil War. There are also a whole host of other episodes on a wide range of events throughout the entire scope of history. So, for your listening pleasure, here are two preview episodes, and be sure to find History Daily wherever you get your podcasts. It's early October 1942, and Europe is in the grips of the Second World War. The Russian city of Stalingrad lies in smoldering ruin. For over two months, the opposing armies of the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany have been locked in a fierce battle over control of Stalingrad. Now this once elegant city on the banks of the River Volga has become a desolate hellscape of rubble and twisted metal. On the top floor of a bombed-out apartment building, Vasily Zaitsev, a Soviet sniper, quietly and calmly surveys the wreckage through his rifle's sight. A bitterly cold wind blows in from the north, whipping up ash and snow. Through gaps in the swirling fog, Vasily catches glimpses of the demolished city, the charred remains of a schoolhouse, a frozen fountain, rows of houses reduced to crumbling brick facades. Vasily cocks his rifle. Somewhere out there, lurking, is a German super sniper who's been terrorizing the Soviets for days. Now Vasily, as the Red Army's best sharpshooter, has been tasked with finding and killing him. Through his scope, Vasily spots an upturned piece of sheet metal balanced on a stack of rubble. He suspects this is where the German sniper is hiding. But before he shoots and gives away his own position, Vasily needs to be certain. He tugs on the communication rope. From a different vantage point, Vasily's comrade, a man named Kulikov, feels the rope being pulled. This is his signal. Kulikov raises a mitten attached to a stick above the window ledge. With this technique, they hope to bait the German sniper into shooting. Vasily watches closely his finger hovering over the trigger, and then the German sniper fires at the decoy and reveals his location. Vasily inhales, holding his breath, and squeezes the trigger. A split second later, the German sniper body slumps from behind the sheet metal. Vasily makes a mental note. That's his 260th kill. With a look of grim resolution, Vasily reloads and begins looking for his next target. Between August and November of 1942, the forces of Nazi Germany lay waste to Stalingrad, where Vasily and his fellow Soviet soldiers fight bitterly and desperately to repel the onslaught. By mid-November, the Germans have almost vanquished the Soviet force, and for Germany's dictator Adolf Hitler, 
Victory seems within reach. But between November and February, victory will give way to calamity. The tide of the Battle of Stalingrad will turn, and the Soviets will emerge victorious. Hitler will be humiliated, and Nazi Germany will spend the rest of the war struggling to repair the damage it incurred at the Battle of Stalingrad, which ended on February 2, 1943. From Noiser and Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is History Daily. History is made every day. On this podcast, every day, we tell the true stories of the people and events that shaped our world. Today is February 2nd. The German defeat at Stalingrad. It's the summer of 1942, six months before the Battle of Stalingrad comes to an end. At this stage in the war, Nazi Germany finds itself in a strong position. The German army, or Wehrmacht, has conquered huge tracts of territory in the Ukraine, Belarus, and the Baltic regions. Meanwhile, German submarines, known as U-boats, are inflicting heavy damages on Allied ships in the Battle of the Atlantic, giving the Axis powers of Germany and Italy the upper hand. Encouraged by these developments, Adolf Hitler turns to the Eastern Front. Following a failed invasion of Moscow in the summer of 1941, Hitler has decided to focus instead on the southern part of Russia. One city in particular has caught Hitler's eye. Stalingrad is an industrial city on the banks of the River Volga. Its riverside location makes it an important shipping hub, connecting western and eastern regions of the country. Stalingrad also contains several factories providing artillery for the Soviet army. Capturing Stalingrad makes good tactical sense. But the main reason Hitler wants to take Stalingrad is less pragmatic and more symbolic. By conquering the city that bears the name of his greatest adversary, Joseph Stalin, Hitler would be inflicting tremendous humiliation on the Soviet leader. So while Stalin and his generals are anticipating Germany to attempt another invasion of Moscow, a massive ground unit of the Wehrmacht, the German 6th Army, has instead marched across the grassy plains of southwest Russia. By late August, they have Stalingrad surrounded. In the city, civilians crowd around radios, anxiously listening to news bulletins. They have been monitoring the German advance for weeks. Soviet generals sent troops to slow the enemy's march towards Stalingrad, but the German 6th Army is simply too powerful. The Soviet troops are no match for the 250,000 German infantrymen, supported by more than 500 panzer tanks. Though they are outnumbered by almost 100,000 men, the Soviet generals are determined to repel the invading force. General Vasily Chukov is the commander of the 62nd Army, the division of the Red Army tasked with defending Stalingrad, and he knows the stakes. He declares, we will defend the city whatever the cost. On August 23rd, an air raid siren penetrates the late summer afternoon. Civilians dive under kitchen tables. School teachers usher children beneath desks. The city's dogs begin to collectively whimper. And although he knew about the impending attack, Stalin refused to evacuate Stalingrad's 400,000 civilians. He believes their presence will motivate his soldiers defending the city. Then, at around 3 p.m., the first bombs drop. From garrisons set around the perimeter of Stalingrad, the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, deploy a seemingly endless wave of large Heinkel aircraft and smaller Stuka dive bombers. In the first 48 hours, the Luftwaffe flies approximately 1,600 sorties, dropping over 1,000 tons of bombs on Stalingrad, considerably more than London suffered at the height of the Blitz, the German bombing campaign against the United Kingdom. The destruction is unprecedented, as is the civilian loss of life. It's estimated that 40,000 people die in the initial attack. By the time the last bomb drops, Stalingrad has been reduced to rubble and embers. The Germans form a defensive ring around Stalingrad, preventing supplies or reinforcements from reaching the city. The commander of the German 6th Army, General Friedrich Paulus, is a meticulous military tactician, and so far his assault is going according to plan. Once the bombardment is over, the German cavalry and infantry divisions enter the city. While Luftwaffe planes swoop and dive and spit bullets at enemy artillery units, wave after wave of panzer tanks roll in to eliminate any survivors. 
By September 12th, two and a half weeks since the siege began, only 20,000 Soviet soldiers remain, leaving many civilians to fend for themselves. Children are forced to dig trenches and repair fortifications. Mothers and wives wield anti-aircraft guns, refusing to leave their posts, even as the German panzers bear down on them. Eventually, the Soviets fall back and base themselves in apartments and houses, sometimes fighting hand-to-hand to defend the city from the Germans. In spite of being outnumbered, the Soviets mount a heroic defense. But the German 6th Army continues their advance. By mid-November, they've managed to take control of 90% of Stalingrad. Three-quarters of the Soviet army is dead, and those who remain have been pushed back to a small strip of land on the west bank of the Volga River. A full Soviet defeat seems inevitable. Stalingrad itself has become a scorched wasteland. In the words of one German officer, Stalingrad is no longer a town. Animals flee this hell. The hardest stones cannot bear it for long. Only men endure. But soon the Germans will be put to the test. The Russian winter is about to arrive, bringing terrible conditions for which the German army is not prepared. And by the time the first frost sets in, the Soviet generals will already be planning their counterattack. It's late November 1942, two months before the German defeat at Stalingrad. The German 6th Army, under General Friedrich Paulus, has driven the Soviet 62nd Army onto a position on the west bank of the Volga River. Three months of fighting has left the German force exhausted and depleted, but seemingly on the verge of victory. But General Paulus, the meticulous tactician who commanded the siege, has made a fatal mistake. He committed his troops to the city, where they became entangled in bitter urban warfare with the Soviet troops. In so doing, he left his flanks vulnerable to attack. On November 19th, the Soviets use this to their advantage. They launch a counterattack, codenamed Operation Uranus. In a pincer move, two Red Army units attack the Germans' northern and southern flanks. The Red Army units quickly overpower the small German divisions defending the flanks and then spread out, encircling the city, until they link up on November 23rd. Their pincer movement seals 300,000 German and Axis soldiers inside Stalingrad in a small portion of the city that would become known as the Stalingrad Cauldron. Suddenly, the German 6th Army finds itself trapped inside a demolished city with no way out. With insufficient clothing and dwindling provisions, the onset of a harsh Russian winter could prove disastrous. The question becomes whether or not the trapped 6th Army should attempt to break out from the cauldron or surrender. General Paulus insists that he lacks both the personnel and the equipment to successfully fight his way out. To even attempt it would be suicidal, he thinks. But Adolf Hitler disagrees. Hitler's desire to conquer Stalingrad has always been rooted in his personal rivalry with Stalin. Now that the invasion has failed, the German Führer needs to find a way to spin this disaster into a tale of German heroism. So he orders Paulus to attempt a breakout of Stalingrad despite the odds. From the comfort of his Austrian mountain retreat, Hitler consults with the head of the Luftwaffe, his loyal servant Hermann Göring. Göring wants to please Hitler. So instead of offering sound military advice, he reassures the Führer that the Luftwaffe's planes will save the day. Göring insists that he can provide the trapped soldiers with all the supplies they need, flying planes over the Soviet barricades and airdropping food, fuel, and ammunition. But both Goering and Hitler underestimate the task at hand. The 6th Army is slowly starving. They would require 700 tons of supplies every day in order to survive. Repelled by the winter weather and Soviet anti-aircraft guns, the Luftwaffe is only able to provide 85 tons a day. On December 23rd, the airdrop mission is abandoned. General Paulus knows that surrender is the only option. But Hitler forbids it, saying that the longer the 6th Army holds out, the better it is for the German war effort, because it draws away the Russian division from the front. But as winter conditions worsen and starvation and disease spread, the German generals trapped in Stalingrad will be forced to make a difficult choice. Defy Hitler's orders or die a slow and agonizing death.
It's January 22, 1943, just days before the German defeat at Stalingrad. General Friedrich Paulus, commander of the German 6th Army, has just received an offer of surrender from the Soviet High Command. With 50,000 German soldiers critically injured and almost no medical supplies, the suffering and misery is indescribable. All food is gone, and starving men have resorted to eating their own horses. Soon they will be forced to resort to cannibalism. But after Paulus requests Hitler's permission to surrender, the Fuhrer replies with a telegraph, ordering the 6th Army to stand fast to the last soldier and the last bullet. He assures Paulus that this heroic struggle will be remembered in German military folklore. And already Hitler is turning his loss into a PR victory. In a public announcement on January 30th, Josef Goebbels, Hitler's propaganda minister, declares, The heroic struggle of our soldiers on the Volga should be a warning for everybody to do the utmost for the struggle for Germany's freedom and the future of our people. But that struggle is about to end. On January 31st, Soviet forces storm into General Paulus's headquarters in a ruined Stalingrad department store. Paulus will later deny surrendering, but there is no doubt he accepts his arrest without resistance. Two days later, the last of the German generals admits defeat. On February 2nd, 1943, the Battle of Stalingrad comes to an end. Of the 300,000 soldiers who were trapped in the cauldron, only 90,000 remain. They are all arrested and marched to Soviet prison camps. Only 5,000 will survive the rest of the war. The Battle of Stalingrad was the bloodiest of World War II, claiming nearly 2 million lives. It is remembered as the worst defeat in German military history and the turning point of the war. Shortly after, Josef Goebbels will make his famous speech at the Berlin Sportpalast, in which he announces that the tide of the war is turning against Germany and that the German people must now adopt total war a policy in which every civilian resource is used in the conflict. But even after resorting to total war, Hitler's military will never recover from the defeat at Stalingrad. Hundreds of thousands of men are dead or captured. The great German military machine will falter, and its forces will be driven into retreat. Hitler will take his own life, and Nazi Germany will surrender. This downfall began when the momentum shifted, and the Germans faced defeat at the Battle of Stalingrad, which came to an end on February 2nd, 1943. Next on History Daily, February 3rd, 1870, the 15th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution is ratified, guaranteeing black men the right to vote. From Noiser and Airship, this is History Daily, hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Audio editing by Molly Bach. Music and sound design by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written and researched by Joe Viner. Executive producers are Stephen Walters for Airship and Pascal Hughes for Noiser. Marcus is a connoisseur of anything that's free, so he was happy to read the disclaimer on TurboTax Free Edition. Roughly 37% of taxpayers qualify. Form 1040 and limited credits only. See how at TurboTax.com. <laughs> that's me! File your taxes 100% free with TurboTax Free Edition and get your max refund guaranteed. See if you qualify to file for free at TurboTax.com. See max refund guarantee details at TurboTax.com guarantees. It's April 7th, 1944, and World War II rages across the globe. But here in southern Poland, a pall of gray mist hangs over the town of Oswiecim. Since the Nazi occupation of Poland began in 1939, Oswiecim has been known by its German name, made notorious by the concentration camp built nearby, Auschwitz. Inside the Auschwitz prison yard, an SS officer strides past rows of shivering inmates. The officer suspects that two prisoners have escaped. As he conducts a head count, he barks out numbers. When the prisoners hear their numbers called, they step forward. And once the roll call is complete, the SS officer turns to a squadron commander and nods sharply. His suspicions were correct. Two prisoners are missing. 
Soon, trucks loaded with armed SS guards thunder around the camp gates as searchlights illuminate the surrounding countryside. Snarling German shepherds are released into the twilight, their noses pressed to the ground. Suddenly, one of the hounds splits from the pack. It bounds towards a woodpile located between the inner and outer perimeter fences. The hound begins sniffing at the wood, just an arm's length from where two prisoners are hiding, Walter Rosenberg and Alfred Wetzler, both Slovakian Jews. Walter and Alfred hope the guards will not think to search for them inside the Auschwitz compound. That's why they chose this hiding place. Once the guards have given up the search, Walter and Alfred will make their escape. But this dog is threatening their plans. Walter and Alfred have sprinkled the woodpile with tobacco soaked in gasoline, which is supposed to mask their scent, but the hound keeps getting closer. Walter hears leather boots striking damp earth. As a guard approaches, Walter braces for the worst. Then suddenly the guard shouts a command in German, and the dog relents. The guard walks off into the distance with the dog at his heels. Walter and Alfred remain hidden inside the woodpile for three days without food or water. When they finally emerge, they sneak through the barbed wire fence and begin a grueling trek across Nazi-occupied Poland. They've escaped with detailed maps of Auschwitz and evidence of the crimes committed there, including information on the gas chambers, which have been used to murder millions of Jews and other people deemed subhuman by Adolf Hitler and the Nazi regime. Two weeks after their escape, Walter and Alfred reach their homeland, Slovakia. From there, they report the horrors taking place inside Auschwitz to Allied intelligence. Their evidence will be part of what is called the Auschwitz Protocols, and it will be the first time the Allied leaders of World War II realize the full extent of the Nazis' atrocities. The report estimates that 1.75 million Jews have already been murdered at Auschwitz alone. The Allied forces continue to press their attack. But even as Hitler's forces falter, the mass extermination of Jews at Auschwitz and other death camps will accelerate. Millions more will perish at the hands of the Nazi regime before the Soviet army reaches southern Poland and liberates Auschwitz on January 27, 1945. From Noiser and Airship, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is History Daily. History is made every day. On this podcast, every day, we tell the true stories of the people and events that shaped our world. Today is January 27th, the liberation of Auschwitz. It's November 1944, seven months after Walter Rosenberg and Alfred Wetzler escaped. From inside his office, Rudolf Hirsch is on the telephone. He listens carefully for several moments and then says, Ja, mein Reichsführer and puts the telephone down. Hers is an SS officer and commandant of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Quiet and mild-mannered, Hers is more reminiscent of a grocery store clerk than a high-ranking Nazi. But during his tenure as commandant of Auschwitz, Hers has become one of the main architects of Hitler's final solution, the name given to the Nazis' efforts to exterminate the entirety of Europe's Jewish population. It was Hirsch who, in 1941, introduced the use of Zyklon B in the camp's gas chamber, a deadly poison that can kill 2,000 victims in less than an hour. By murdering prisoners with Zyklon B, Hirsch turned this camp into the largest and deadliest of all Nazi concentration camps and earned himself the nickname the Devil of Auschwitz. Hirsch gets up from his work and strides up to the office window and peers outside. He absentmindedly fondles his wedding ring, twisting it back and forth around his finger, an old habit. Beyond the window, row upon row of wooden and brick barracks fade into the distance. Tall watchtowers and barbed wire fences loom through the winter fog. Auschwitz is divided into one main camp and around 30 subcamps. The largest subcamp is Auschwitz II, or Birkenau, the extermination facility. It's at Birkenau that the majority of the killings take place within the Auschwitz complex. Here, along the barracks and outbuildings, concrete crematoriums incinerate the bodies of those murdered in the gas chambers. Hirsch surveys all of this with cold, unfeeling eyes. Since 1940, the Commandant has presided over daily operations of Auschwitz. 
Now, after speaking on the telephone with his boss, head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler, Hirsch has been ordered to destroy everything he has built. Victory in World War II is looking increasingly unlikely for Nazi Germany. The Allied forces of Britain, the United States, and the Soviet Union are sweeping across Europe from all directions, forcing the Nazis into a hasty retreat. With the prospect of defeat looming, the once tightly disciplined Nazi regime teeters on the brink of chaos. Hitler's response to his impending downfall is to accelerate the mass murder of Jews. Between May and July of 1944, after the successful Allied invasion of Western Europe, the Nazi-controlled nation of Hungary sent 420,000 Jews to Auschwitz. Three-quarters of them were killed on arrival. But other Nazi officials, Himmler included, see the direction the war is taking and have decided to attempt to put a halt to the genocide. It's unlikely that Himmler, who designed the infrastructure that enabled the Holocaust, has suddenly developed a guilty conscience. Rather, it's an act of cowardice. By going against Hitler's order and putting an end to the extermination of prisoners at Auschwitz, Himmler is perhaps hoping the conquering allies will look upon him more favorably after the war. This is not the first time the Nazi high command has exhibited self-awareness of the scale of their monstrosities. Since 1942, when the final solution was first put into motion, there have been consistent attempts to obfuscate the death toll. Millions of bodies have been burned in crematoriums, leaving the sky above Auschwitz permanently choked with an acrid black smog. But following Himmler's command, Rudolf Hirsch has been ordered to halt the systematic slaughter of the camp's inmates and to physically dismantle all evidence that it ever took place. But the Nazi guards do not perform this intensely laborious work. Rather, it's the prisoners who are tasked with deconstructing the very machines in which their own families were murdered. Brick by brick, the inmates dismantle the crematoriums and gas chambers. Others exhume mass graves and burn the bodies before burying the ashes. By December, German intelligence is reporting that the Soviet Union's Red Army has assembled two million men along the frontier of Eastern Europe. With the bulk of Hitler's army occupied on the Western Front, fewer than half a million Nazi soldiers remain in the East. And when news of the Red Army's advance reaches Auschwitz, panic breaks out among the Nazi ranks. On January 17th, the camp's officials are given the order to flee. Rudolf Hirsch himself, fearing retribution if the Allies discover his true identity, disguises himself as a sailor and joins the German Navy under a false name. Among the fleeing Auschwitz officials is one of the most notorious of the Nazi criminals, the angel of death, Dr. Josef Mengele. From a laboratory within the camp, Mengele carried out horrifying human experiments on the prisoners, developing Nazi ideology's grotesque fascination with eugenics and racial purity. Because his medical notes were destroyed, it's not easy to separate fact from rumor when it comes to Mengele. But it's indisputable that his particular brand of evil was unleashed on the prisoners of Auschwitz with sadistic and unrestrained brutality. But Mengele is in retreat now. As he and the rest of the Auschwitz officials flee back into Germany, the question arises of what to do with the remaining inmates. The Red Army is now only days away from the camp. The war is already lost, and yet Hitler refuses to release hundreds of thousands of prisoners. The solution he comes up with will cost the lives of over a quarter of a million people. It's January 18th, 1945, nine days before the liberation of Auschwitz. A large group of prisoners have been told to line up in the central courtyard. While snow drifts slowly down, an SS officer tells the prisoners that they are being transferred to a different concentration camp, not by train, but on foot. Among the assembled prisoners is 23-year-old Philippe Muller. Some nine months ago, Philippe helped two of his friends escape from Auschwitz, Walter Rosenberg and Alfred Wetzler. Philippe supplied Walter and Alfred with details of the Nazi crematoriums. He gained this information from working as a Zonderkommando, a prisoner forced to assist with the disposal of gas chamber victims. One source of solace for conducting this horrific work was that Walter and Alfred might pass on the information to Allied intelligence and that Auschwitz might be liberated. But since their escape, no news has come, and Philippe, having lost hope, voluntarily entered a gas chamber. But a young girl recognized Philippe and urged him not to take his own life, 
in order that he might live to tell their story. Philippe agreed. So now he trudges through thick snow and driving wind on a mission to survive and bear witness. Philippe Mueller and 60,000 other Auschwitz prisoners march hundreds of miles through freezing conditions as the Red Army forces the Nazis back to their deepest lines. The procession becomes known as the Death March, as prisoners are shot for lagging behind or even just stopping to catch their breath. Others die from exhaustion or starvation. And of the total number of prisoners forced on death marches from Nazi concentration camps, over 250,000 perish. It's the morning of January 27, 1945, just nine days after the death march set off from Auschwitz. Ivan Martinushkin, a 21-year-old lieutenant in the Red Army's 332nd Rifle Division, wakes up in a Nazi garrison where he and his fellow Russian soldiers spent the night. For the last two weeks, Ivan's division has been sweeping south through Poland as part of the Red Army's Vistula Oder offensive. After liberating the cities of Warsaw and Krakow from the Nazis, they pushed the enemy back across the Vistula River and continued south for a few miles before settling down inside this abandoned garrison for the night. It was so dark when they arrived that they could barely see, and so cold that they didn't linger outside for long. But when Ivan and his fellow soldiers step outside the next morning, they are confounded by what they see in the morning light. A towering barbed wire fence. Ivan and his fellow soldiers slowly approach the barbed wire, with rifles raised, their boot crunching over freshly fallen snow. Above the locked iron gates, darkly silhouetted against the pale winter sky, is the German phrase, Arbeit macht frei, or work will set you free. Ivan observes that the ground beyond the wire is covered with what looks like bundles of sticks and rags. Then he notices the smell. It's a noxious scent, unlike anything he's ever experienced. He lifts his forearm to his mouth. Some of his comrades begin to retch. But then there's movement. There are people behind the wire. Ivan raises his rifle, but it quickly becomes clear that these are not enemy combatants. Slowly, cautiously, they emerge from wooden outhouses, their thin arms held aloft, their faces slate gray and filled with fear. It dawns on the Soviet soldiers what they've discovered. For the past several months, following the publication of a report about a concentration camp called Auschwitz, rumors have been circulating about Nazi abuses, including acts of genocide. Many were dismissive of the rumors. They were simply too horrifying to be true. Ivan lowers his weapon. He realizes that the bundles of sticks and rags are corpses, the few bodies the Nazis didn't manage to burn before they abandoned the camp. Soon, a Soviet T-34 tank bursts from the ranks and crashes through the barbed wire fence. Ivan and his comrades follow after. When the prisoners realize that these are Soviet soldiers, their fear subsides, and they rush forward to greet their liberators, overwhelmed with relief. Only around 9,000 prisoners are left in Auschwitz when the Red Army arrives. Following their liberation, a medical tent is set up to attend to the survivors' dire health. Still, many will die of disease in the days that follow. And for the rest, once they have regained their strength, they will have to find their own way home. Approximately 1.3 million people were killed in Auschwitz between 1940 and 1945. Soon, word of this horrific statistic will make its way back to the leaders of the Allied forces, who in the months and years following the war will set their sights on tracking down those involved and bringing them to justice. It's March 11, 1946, over a year since the liberation of Auschwitz. In a rural German village, 25 British soldiers quietly approach an isolated farmhouse. Their commander, Hans Alexander, a Berlin-born Jew, knocks on the wooden door. Moments later, it opens, revealing a haggard-looking man in stained work clothes. He claims to be a local farmer. Alexander smiles and asks to come inside. Reluctantly, the old man agrees. While sitting around the man's kitchen table, Alexander tells him they're looking for someone named Rudolf Hurs, the former commandant of Auschwitz. Then Alexander explains that they have received intelligence, suggesting Hurs is hiding in the area. Man shrugs, claiming he's never heard of hers. Alexander notices the man fiddling with his wedding ring, twisting it back and forth around his finger. An old habit, the man explains nervously. 
Alexander asks to see the man's wedding ring. At first, he refuses, but when one of Alexander's lieutenants offers to cut his finger off, the man agrees. Inscribed on the inside of the band is the man's name, Rudolf Hirsch. Hirsch will be arrested and later executed for crimes against humanity. At his trial, he confesses to the murder of 2.5 million people. Official estimates put the Auschwitz death toll lower than this, but the true number can never be known, as many prisoners' deaths went undocumented. Today, Auschwitz is visited by millions of people every year. But the site where the camp once stood is no longer a symbol of suffering or fear. The Auschwitz-Birkenau Memorial and Museum now stands as a stark reminder that the greatest respect one can pay to the dead is to constantly strive to educate, to learn, and to remember the horror that was fully exposed when the camp was liberated on January 27, 1945. Next on History Daily, January 28, 1986, the space shuttle Challenger breaks apart 73 seconds into its flight, killing all seven astronauts on board. From Noiser and Airship, this is History Daily. Hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham. Audio editing by Molly Bond. Music and sound design by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written and researched by Joe Viner. Executive producers are Stephen Walters for Airship and Pascal Hughes for Noiser. If you have enjoyed these episodes, be sure to search for History Daily wherever you get your podcasts. It's a great daily dose of history delivered directly to your listening device.